Hello everyone, my name's Tim Phillips and uh, I'm speaking to Gordon Graylish today who's the uh, Vice President and GM for Enterprise Solutions Sales at Intel. Is that correct, Gordon? That is correct. Gordon Graylish. HPC means a lot of different things depending on which vendor you speak to. So how does Intel define it and, and how big is the pool of potential HPC users? We would agree with your statement that it means many things, and I think we take a fairly broad approach to it, but I guess look at it as technical computing. Um, and by that, it, you know, historically it's come from a place of, of academic computing, uh, trying to solve the world's big problems, whether that's uh, gen genomics or the weather. And it's moved from there, though, to a much broader Applicability. So it's it's now the core of how movies are made. It's uh, central to how a car is designed, and it's moving into more and more um, areas of of industry as people replace the physical process of design with a, a computer aided process. Do you feel that there are some industries where more could be made of HPC? Oh, absolutely. I think you can certainly see certain industries where it has become uh, it, just the norm. So if you're in the automotive business today, the idea of not using computational fluid dynamics to design your, your car and make it slippier, you know, it, it just, you wouldn't even conceive of that. Uh, likewise, if you look at uh, the pharmaceutical industries, it, it really literally couldn't exist without the use of, of, of high-performance computing. Uh, on the other hand, the more shall we say, mundane industries as people would perceive them, you know, the broader range of industries where people um, perhaps are characterized by smaller companies, et cetera, haven't been able to afford it. So it, it's been purview of, of the industries that had very large players in it. I think we're going to see that changing. And in fact, we're seeing that as a, a matter of industrial policy in a number of countries. How does this affordability come about then? Well, you know, I think that's a very, very good point, and I think there's there's two ways of looking at it. Just, I mean, Moore's Law does a pretty darn good job of reducing the cost of, of computing. Um, and if we look back over the last uh, um, few years, we, we've seen an absolutely mammoth uh, reduction in cost. So the cost of a teraflop, for example, which is um, a, a billion um, floating point operation, that has gone from since just since 1997 from a hundred thousand from fifty five thousand dollars to a hundred dollars, just as a you know as an example. So if you look at that, you know that that is a mammoth disruptive change in cost. But but that said, that's not enough in itself to bring people in uh, to using these kind of tools because there's expertise required and understanding how to do it is as much of a barrier for smaller companies as the affordability of the technology. How do you think that can be changed? Does Intel have any part in that? Because really your job begins and ends with providing the hardware, doesn't it? Well, no, it doesn't. And as a matter of fact, I think we have, a, we have an enormous uh, role to play in this. Uh, if, we, if we look at uh, as an example, um, the area of tools. So if you think about you want to do a job, um, you don't want to write this at its very basic level. You want to have tools and say, oh, I want to commit this function or I want to run this algorithm. And if you know what those are, you can string them together and you can put together a program. We write uh, many of those tools and, um, and they're our major source for innovation in that space to make it easier, lower the barriers so you don't need the same level of expertise that you might have in the past to be able to affect this. So, you know, lowering that is really key. We also sponsor um, labs within dozens of universities around the world where people are taught how to program in using multi-course, which is the source of much of the innovation in multi in, in high-performance computing. Now, th that's a really interesting one. If you think about how the world has traditionally worked, people program sequentially. So you would have a program that says, take this data, move it over here, store it there, multiply it by something, and, and do something else with it. You know, nice and sequential, one after the other. That doesn't take advantage of all of these 
massive clusters of, of resource that allow us to get to you know, 10 petaflops um, of performance. There's been a huge investment in teaching people at the university how do you program expecting to have 100, 1,000, 10,000, 100,000, a million processors doing work in parallel? How do you ensure that that work is basically done in a, in a way that is simple and actually scales the performance and doesn't just become a bunch of bottlenecks? Do you have a strategy for developing um, a hybrid system, looking at uh, special purpose hardware accelerators? You went some way down that road with Larrabee. What's the, uh, what's the story at the moment? First of all, one of the factors that you have to t take into account when you're designing computer systems is the frequency of the parts because there's a, uh, a cubic relationship between frequency and the power consumption. So and what I mean by that is if I drop my frequency, I get a much larger drop in the power consumption as a result. That says there's a limit to how fast I can make an individual core run and still be reasonable from the amount of power. High performance computing isn't a thing. It's a whole wide range of workloads of actual algorithms and programs. And those workloads have a range of requirements. A large percentage of them, probably the largest percentage is today focused, uh, they're, they're constrained by the performance of the core. So they like big cores that can do lots of work. There's other uh, algorithms, though, that like little cores. In other words, they, they don't actually ask the core to do a lot of work, but if you give them a whole bunch of cores, they can work in parallel together. So when you look at this, you say, well, I want to be able to give the best architecture to both of those kinds of workloads. That is where you know we, we've looked at understanding those workloads that benefit from lots of little cores and can get massively parallel. And what we found was that even within a, a workload that likes that technology, there's a range of other work, uh, uh, other routines that like the opposite. And so what we've really focused on is trying to solve the, the, the really hard problem, which is the programming model. So we focused on, first of all, developing that massively parallel environment, an architecture we call MIPE, or many inter internet cores, and uh, we're, we're working with the industry right now on, on that. But very importantly, we've focused on delivering the compilers and technologies that would allow me to write my code and have that compiler intelligently decide what resources are there and which type of computing that they want to apply to it. The, the race is on for commercial exascale computing. Uh, how important is Mike in this? You could do exascale um, without Mike, and that would work for the type of workload that like the big cores. Uh, so but the issue with, with getting to exascale, and, and this is a, a fascinating great challenge, is you need approximately a billion connections in that device in that, in that cluster to, to get to exascale. That requires a hundred times reduction in the power per useful piece of work. It also means I have to solve big issues with memory bandwidth. I have to solve the interconnect speed and, and I have to put all of this together in a way that I have a working reliable system that stays up you know, with that huge number of elements stays up for a long period of time. So the solving this requires you know, a, addressing all aspects of computing. The memory, the interconnect, the processing, the power, the materials used, the configuration of the, of the systems. To do that, we obviously are doing a lot of uh, our own research uh, because we are committed to achieving that level of performance within the decade. Now, we can't do that on our own. We need, first of all, that we need to solve some big industry issues to, to make this happen. So we've worked with a number of um, universities. We've set up three uh, major labs that are specifically targeting exascale computing. Uh, we have one at IMEC in Belgium. 
uh, at C CEA in Paris at the University of Versailles and at the University of Ulick in Germany. Intel certainly doesn't have it all its own way. There is a lot of competition. Specifically, ARM has gained a lot of attention recently uh, for making some steps towards solving that issue of power consumption that you were talking about. How do you feel that Intel's competitive position is against ARM and also the other competitors that you see in HPC? It doesn't change what we do. We recognize we have to always run quickly and continue to evolve, and, and that's what we're doing. To be successful in high-performance computing, you have to solve those multiple issues I mentioned. You have to solve the design of the processor. Uh, you, have to just, you have to solve that for both workloads of the large, powerful core and the smaller core. You have to solve power, and you have to solve tools. And I think you know, those challenges exist for all companies. Um, it takes real expertise to do that to solve those kind of problems. And while we would always expect to see competition, you know, our focus is making sure we excel in all three of those areas. Where does cloud fit in? Today, for example, there's a number of efforts in, in many countries, as I mentioned, to try to facilitate access for the middle-sized company, what we call the missing middle. It, tra it can transform their competitiveness. You know, having, having that capability... Uh, can shorten development cycles by many months. It can reduce costs by multiples, um, and it can result in breakthroughs that are totally unanticipated. The problems are not uh, simple, although we believe they are surmountable over time. You have to figure out, in some cases, how to bill for it, but how to train people, how to use it, how to schedule it. Um, you know, accessing these clusters through a cloud environment is not without its challenges because most of the challenges are about it's just not mature today. Some simple examples, if you're a, a small company sitting in Oxfordshire, how do I get my, you know, my thousand gigabytes of data to the cluster in order to do the, the, to do the computing, right? And simple, simple practical things that we need to solve uh, to enable people to use it. The rewards of getting us there are going to be very great, um, and we are definitely seeing um, huge interest from governments around the world on how do they facilitate this, how do they transform the design process so that it affects you know, all of the companies, not just the very biggest. Finally, Gordon, how important is HPC to Intel? If Intel decided that it was no longer a priority and it wanted to focus on a lower more commercial end of computing, would it lose anything? Oh, yeah. I mean, high-performance computing has always been critical, and, it, and it's critical if you think about what we do for a living, you know, in delivering um, ever-increasing performance, uh, lower power, uh, and enabling new experiences. You're always running against the envelope. The, you, you know, the, you're pushing that bubble to solve new issues. High-performance computing hits those issues first. Um, it's the area that really starts tackling latency, that starts worrying about high number of high amount of parallelism. And those problems ultimately need to be solved for all of computing if we are, are to continue to deliver Moore's Law. Uh, so high-performance computing does serve that, um, that role in a similar way to Technologies come out of Formula One and, and racing into the general car market. High-performance computing is, is our race, race horse, I guess, to some extent. Okay, so HPC, the Formula One of computing. Uh, Gordon Graylish, thank you uh, very sorry, much. I'd rather say the, horse, the race horse. <laughs> the race horse of computing. Whichever one you prefer, Gordon Graylish, thank you very much. <laughs>